Hello, my name is Alan Hudson from the Immuno-Oncology Translational Network Data Management Resource Center. I also serve as Chair of Biostatistics and Bioinformatics at Wellesley Park Comprehensive Cancer Center. Before we start the seminar, I just have a few bookkeeping items to go over. Questions will be responded to at the end of both presentations. Please enter your questions in the Zoom Q&A box, not the chat box, the Q&A box. The audience can prioritize the order of the questions by clicking on the thumbs up button. Closed captioning is available. The closed captioning for today's webinar can be access, accessed by clicking on the live transcript option in the Zoom menu at the bottom of your screen. Instructions are also provided in the chat box. If you're having technical issues, you can make a comment in the Zoom chat box. I would also like to note that in supporting the next generation of cancer researchers, today's Cancer Moonshot Seminar will, will feature research from talented early career scientists. These are abstract driven talks, which are nominated by the Cancer Moonshot investigators and selected by NCI staff. With that, I would like to turn the proceedings over to our moderator, Dr. Scott Armstrong. Dr. Armstrong is the chairman of pediatric oncology at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute Associate Chief of the Division of Hematology and Oncology at Boston Children's Hospital. The major focus of Dr. Armstrong's career has been on delineating the biology of childhood cancers, particularly leukemia. His work has led to the development of new therapeutic approaches for multiple, multiple types of cancer that are not being tested. His work has been recognized by several multiple awards. Dr. Armstrong. Thank you, Alan, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, we have two very interesting presentations today from early career investigators, as Alan mentioned. So we're going to jump right into it. Uh, the first one is from Katya Rebola, who's a postdoctoral scholar in the Division of Oncological Sciences at OHSU Knight Cancer Institute in Portland. Her research is focused on the characterization of the bone marrow microenvironment and drug resistance in leukemia. The title of her talk today is Targeting CCL2 slash CCR2 Signaling to Overcome MEK Inhibitor Resistance in AML. So, Katya, are you here? There you are. You can take it away. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong. Uh, thank you all for being here today, attending my Frank seminar. Uh, I hope you enjoy my talk. Uh, so, as Dr. Armstrong said, uh, I'm going to talk about one of the projects that I've been working on for the past year or so, uh, the Agarval Lab at OHSU, that's named Targeting the CCO2 Pathway to Overcome MAC Resistance in AML. So let's go jump on a right there. So. The main focus of my research is to understand the mechanisms involved in drug resistance in AML. AML, very simple, just to give you some background, uh, we have abnormal proliferation of myeloid cells and it's very challenging because there's a high rate of mortality and, and also it's one of the leukemias with like highest number of diagnoses annually in the US. What are the challenges of treating AML? Two specific ones, uh, genetic heterogeneity that varies uh, how the patients respond. And most important that would be the main focus of my talk today is the bone marrow microenvironment. There's so many factors there that can affect the disease evolution, that can lead to drug resistance, as well as relapse uh, in several patients. And why MAC resistance? Why trametinib in particular? That's the drug that I'm going to focus today. Trametinib is a very effective MAC inhibitor uh, that is clinically approved in combination with dabrafenib, <laughs> that is a BRAF uh, inhibitor to treat melanoma. And in the AML case, we had so far two clinical trials that didn't show like very promising results, but this drug is so potent, so great that we decided to give it a shot. And maybe it's just a matter of finding the right combination with trametinib to help to treat AML. So that will be my whole journey here today. So 
brief overview, uh, the main objective for this research is to identify a potential therapeutic target to overcome resistance uh, to MAC inhibitors, in my particular case, trametinib and AML. And we have a few research questions that we're hoping to answer um, with this study. One of them, is it possible to overcome resistance uh, to trametinib in AML? And if yes, how we can do that? Like what cytokine, like is related to the bone marrow, the bone marrow microenvironment, as I mentioned earlier, and pathways are involved in this trametinib resistance, as well as like, what are the strategies that are like be promising to help with this, to help to overcome this resistance in AML. And I'll try to answer those questions along my talk. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to. <laughs> So to start this journey, we have this, we initiated with this integrated approach in which we took advantage of the BDAML database. That is like a wonderful database to study leukemia. We selected 302 AML patient samples and we did a small molecule inhibitor screen in which we separate those samples in sensitive and resistant to four major therapeutic targets. We selected a FEL3 inhibitor, a JAK inhibitor, a BCL2 inhibitor, and three different MAC inhibitors, one of them obviously trametinib. So the way that we separated them was the lowest uh, 20%, we considered them sensitive to that particular inhibitor, and the highest we considered resistant. And then we follow up with like the cytokine measurement and some gene expression analysis. The cytokine uh, took some interesting results. Uh, we saw some higher levels of different cytokines in serafinib, that is the FEL3 inhibitor, they're very specific to them, as you can see here in this yellow on the left side of my heat map. Comparison to this other group of cytokines here that we saw mostly in trametinib or the other MEK inhibitors, some of them are present in both, in all of them, sorry. And one interesting thing that kind of like draw our attention is that CCL2, this specific cytokine, shows different modulation uh, in different inhibitors. So we observed that in all MAC inhibitors, it was super high regulated. And in venetoclax, that is the BCL2, it's the opposite. We saw some decrease. Yeah, so just mentioned. And with that, we're just like, hmm, this is intriguing. Uh, we obviously, based on what we know so far about the bone marrow microenvironment, extrinsic factors definitely play a role on it, uh, and they will definitely influence the drug response. And there's some like certain cytokines that directly associated with resistance sensitivity to some inhibitors. And in this particular case, we're intrigued by the CCL2 that is modulated differently in those inhibitors. So next, we decide to expand a little bit of our like approach. This is just pretty much a summary of what we've seen before. The resistant and sensitive sample, just a different way of seeing the heat map. Uh, the levels are definitely higher in trametinib uh, resistant samples and bruxolitinib in comparison to venetoclax. So definitely varies among them. But what is interesting in when we treat some of those AML samples with gradient concentrations of those three inhibitors that I'm showing you here, we see that in the presence of CCO2, you have some sort of advantage in which you decrease the sensitivity of those samples to the inhibitor that you're using it. So in the presence of CCO2, samples treated with trametinib and rufolitinib definitely higher AUCs in comparison to the ones treated with venetoclax and CCO2. So like, oh, there's something here. Definitely uh, we're into something. CCL2 might be important for this drug response. But what exactly is CCL2? CCL2, it's called chemokine CC motif ligand like 2, or also MCP1, monocytic chemoattractin protein 1. It regulates, we know so far that it regulates monocytes and macrophages migration and infiltration. It has strong pro-inflammatory function. We also know that increased CCL2 like, in the serum of ML patients, like in comparison to healthy uh, samples. So it's like, all right, so maybe this 
in some way is related to what we see down the line with traumatic and resistance. We probably like can connect them. And very previously, like initial hypothesis, we're like, all right, uh, there's definitely a correlation between CCO2 and trametinib resistance, but what exactly is happening? Is CCO2, CCR2, that is the receptor axis, altering the resistance to therapy? Yes, no. And with that, we started like picturing, putting together the scenario in which the resistance is acquired by those AML cells but shifting to a different pathway when they're exposed to traumatinib in order for them to survive and proliferate. And this over time kind of leads to this drug resistance that we observed down the line later on. But okay, good. We know a lot of information about CCL2, but not exactly what is doing it in traumatinib resistance. So to tackle that question, we developed some resistance uh, cell lines to trametinib. I'm showing you one of them. We created three different ones and tested all of them. But for the sake of time, we're seeing this one, MOM13. As you can see here on the left side, uh, there's a very big difference in sensitivity to the resistant lines. There are the red line here in comparison to the sensitive, that is the blue as well as the AUC of those graphs, very significant difference. So definitely resistant to traumatinib. We also checked the levels of CCO2, um, the levels of expression by Western blot and kind of like correlating with the heat map that I showed you earlier that we have more uh, CCO2 in resistant samples. In cell lines, we see the same thing. So we definitely have higher levels, uh, intracellular levels. And by, measured by ELISA, we also see the same uh, trend. And one interesting thing is when we treat those cells resistant to traumatinib with only traumatinib or traumatinib plus CCO2, we see some sort of advantage, growth advantage, as seen by this black line here that definitely has a much higher cell number in comparison to the cells that are resistant, they're only treated with trametinib. So in some way, CCO2 is providing some benefit to those resistant cells. But um, what exactly are the biological effects of like exposing cells to CCO2? We give them advantage, but what is going on downstream? To kind of like Answer that question, we perform a phosphoproteomics analysis with our parental cells, sensitive cells. Uh, we treat them with trametinib plus or minus CCL2 for five to 60 minutes. Interesting findings here. Um, there's definitely response uh, to only trametinib, to only CCL2. But interestingly, when you combine them, we see some increased activities of very important kinases uh, for cellular regulation. Some of the MAPK family, some, cell, some kinases involved in cell cycle progression, like a couple of CDKs and some of the SARC family. And this kind of like, all right, so that's probably the route that the cells take when they're trying to escape from the traumatinib treatment. But this is not enough to answer our question about like what's the role of CCO2, CCR2 in this resistance. So to kind of like add one extra layer to this question, we like, all right, we see some modifications in protein levels. What other genes are associated with this traumatinib resistant development? In parallel to the phosphoproteomic, we decide to perform a CRISPR analysis with our resistant cells. And what we observed uh, very briefly, it's that proteins from the PI3K, AKT, and MAPK pathways are definitely uh, offering some sort of resistance to the traumatinib cells. And when we transduce those cells with the single guide RNA targeting some of those proteins, we see that the knockout lines specific for NRAS, PI3K, and MAPK have a reducing viability in comparison to the controls. So interesting, uh, we start to like picturing this together that 
there's possibility that those proteins, if you tackle them, if you target them, you might be able to rescue those cells from traumatic resistance. But there's still like some of the questions that we need to answer in order to get the big picture of what's going on. So with these proteins in mind, those clues were like, all right, if we target them, what happens? Uh, what are the primary effects of inhibiting them in those resistant cells? Again, to answer this, we went back to our BAML database, uh, trust, trusty A database, and we put those two figures together here. Uh, they kind of like, they're different, but in some way similar. Uh, Interesting finds from this analysis is that some inhibitors in combination with trametinib definitely uh, show some improvement regarding cell viability. So we see a much reduced AUC as well as here in this heat map. When you combine trametinib with idolalicid, that is a PI3K. And remember, we just saw in the CRISPR the PI3K might be involved in traumatic resistance, as well as some CDKs, like PALBO, some cell cycle uh, proteins. Okay, the ones that we saw in the phosphoproteomics. So we're like, okay, this is interesting. We're seeing some stuff here that might be correlated with what we got before. And we decided to expand this and do some analysis of the cells in which we incubate them with some inhibitors talking this uh, pathways. So here we have idilalicib that targets PI3K. We have JNK that is a MAPK9, part of the MAPK pathway, and uh, cell cycle proteins with double cyclic. We saw that there's some lower viability for the combinations in comparison to the individual treatment, as we see here by the bars of the AUCs. But what is nice is that in correlation with CRISPR, uh, we see that the combo with PI3K inhibitor is definitely more effective than the other two combos. So maybe this is definitely one protein involved in the resistance. One more thing that we did uh, to corroborate uh, our previous results, we treat those cells with different inhibitors in which we combine them with trametinib, and we observe the changes downstream uh, of multiple proteins that are part of the, obviously, PI3K pathway. Some of the SARC pathways that we saw in the phosphoproteomics, obviously MAP case, and cell cycle, cell cycle pathway. I'm sorry. And interesting highlights here, we see that some proteins related to those pathways are definitely affected and show much more like reduced levels when incubated, when those resistant cells are incubated with trametinib in one of those inhibitors. So we're kind of, all right, so maybe that's the combination, like some of the combinations that I might be able to use in order to overcome resistance with trametinib because we're definitely seeing some changes. but. Okay, I'm telling you of different cell signaling pathways that might be altered uh, that we might be able to target to overcome resistance, but what is the role of CCO2 in all of this? Um, we gather some information, as I said before. So phosphoproteomics, we kind of see that when you expose the cells to CCO2 or trametinib, or both together, we activate certain pathways. So MAPK, obviously, SARC, and cell cycle pathways. We also saw that knockdown of PI3K and MAPK pathways might be able to resensitize AML cells to trametinib. And our immunoblot analysis showed the suppression of the proteins involved in the PI3K, MAPK, and cell cycle pathways show some promising results. So the initial figure that I showed you that we have some deviation of the pathway when the cells are exposed to trametinib, we believe what's going on, it's something like this. We see the traumatic resistance is probably being mediated by the increased activation of those pathways involved the PI3K, French, SARC with some JNK, MAPK, and this is what kind of like helps the cell to become resistant. All right, I promise we're almost there. <laughs> One last thing that I need to tell you is, okay, we're targeting multiple pathways, but 
what about like targeting CCL2 pathway directly, going to the source and targeting the receptor of this cytokine? So first thing that we did, we knocked down the receptors from we two different uh, single guys RNAs that we used, and they show that when those cells are CCR2 knocked out, we have a decreased viability in comparison to the control. So definitely CCR2 is important for those cells. And similar to what I did with the other inhibitors, I also exposed my sensitive and parental resistant and parental cells to traumatic and the CCR2 inhibitor, and in this case, that's the name, a lot of numbers, I know. And what we see here when we expose them, this is like a synergy assay, uh, we see lower viability for the combination in comparison with the individual treatment, which is very, very promising because it's a very big difference. And when we look at their zip scores, we see some sort of synergy, meaning that if you combine them, you might have some higher efficacy in the in overcoming traumatic resistance. We also did a cell trace staining, so cell trace violet staining, in which we check proliferation and apoptosis. And we see that we have a decrease in proliferation and increase in apoptosis when you expose traumatic resistant cells to those inhibitors. And this data in some way demonstrate that targeting this in this receptor can definitely resensitize the cells. One last thing, same panel of proteins that I did with the previous inhibitor. We expose those cells to a gradient of the CCR2 inhibitor and correlating with the uh, phosphoproteomics, CRISPR, and our initial Western blot analysis, we see the proteins involved in the PI3K, MAPK, and cell cycle pathways definitely decrease in expression when exposed to a gradient of the CCR2 inhibitor in combination with trametinib. And with that, I know that was like very, very fast. Uh, I'm just gonna summarize our main findings very briefly. We observed the high levels of CCO2 somewhere associated with traumatic resistance in AML, exposing CC, like those cells uh, that are resistant to CCO2 and traumatic activate many pro-survival pathways uh, in those cells. And if we target them, we might be able to overcome resistant to trametinib and definitely decrease proliferation and increase apoptosis. Very briefly, our main uh, takeaway from this is that CCO2, CCR2 axis and their novel target pathways might be used to overcome resistance and help those cells. And we hope to identify like for future, obviously, where CCO2 is being produced. Uh, we wanna test the efficacy in patient samples and hopefully expand this to in vivo models. With that, I would like to thank uh, everybody that collaborated in this project. My lab, my PI, Dr. Agarval, wonderful mentor is helping me a lot during the past year. Everybody that collaborated, him and Malignant's team, PNLL, all of our patient sample processors, the computational team, uh, Nicholas Shore from the MD Answer Cancer Center and all of our funding. And you guys for being here today. I appreciate your presence and thank you. And if you want to join the Agrafal Lab, <laughs> we're looking for more people. Thank you. And with that, I'll hand over to Frank. Thanks. Thank you, Katya. That, that was great. Um, and, and please do hang around for questions and answer, a uh, question and answer afterwards. Um, and just so everyone, you may know this already, but we'll keep the questions and the discussion until after both talks uh, have, have been done. And also, I'd like to remind you to please put your questions in the Q&A uh, box rather than the chat box on, on Zoom. We've already got a few, and um, we, we're uh, suspecting many more. And whether be, they be for Katya or Frank coming up, please do put them in that Q&A section. So our next speaker is Frank Zolzuski from... Um, who get, obtained his PhD in biology at the Max Delbruck Center and the Free University in Berlin in 2015, and then moved to the lab of Eric Collin at the Fred Hutch, Hutchinson Cancer Center as a postdoctoral fellow and later a, a senior staff scientist. And his work is focused on oncogenic functions of gene fusions in pediatric brain cancers, most notably YAP1 fusions along with and INTREC uh, gene fusions. And he's going to tell us today about a YAP1 uh, mammal 2 fusion uh, that 
they've been working on in um, in meningiomas. So Frank, take it away. Thank you so much for the introduction and for the opportunity uh, to present our work here today that was performed at the Fred Hutch in, um, in Seattle at Eric Holland's lab. So as a brief introduction, YAP1 is a um, proto-oncogene uh, whose activity is regulated by the HIPPO signaling pathway. And at the top of the HIPPO signaling pathway is NF2 that then activates a tumor suppressive kinase pathway um, that ultimately phosphorylates YAP1 and TAS and inhibits their activation by excluding them from the nucleus and also degradating them. And if you look at different cancers and look at what kind of um, what kind of mutations occur in the HIPPO signaling pathway, you see that there's usually no very, very few mutations in the actual tumors, in the actual oncogenic pathway, part of the pathway, but most of these mutations actually um, happen in the tumor suppressive upstream pathway. And that is likely because the HIPPO signaling pathway phosphorylates YAP1 at several residues. So like a single point mutation is not sufficient to deregulate and the activity of YAP1. However, nature of course found a way to directly activate YAP1, YAP1 itself. And that's that happens through the so-called YAP1 gene fusions. And these YAP1 gene fusions, they've been found in different cancers all over the body. They're usually rare subtypes of, of cancers, um, but there are quite, quite a lot of them. And um, previously we selected um, four of these gene fusions and um, looked at the, basically tried to come up with a couple of hallmarks that describe their functions. And here on the, on, the, on the left side, you can see the four that we selected, um, YAP1 FAM, YAP1 MLD1, um, YAP1 SS18 and YAP1 TV3. And you can see here in these, these diagrams that they all lose or retain different parts of YAP1. And they what they have in common that they all retain the N-terminal part of of YAP1 and then different parts of YAP1 are truncated and replaced by the C-terminal fusion partner. And the hallmarks that we came up with um, in, the, in the paper that we published in 2020 is that um, all of these YAP1 gene fusions that we looked at, they're all oncogenic and I'm gonna come, and come to this in a, in a second. Um, we found that um, these YAP1 fusions exert both YAP activity and activity of the C-terminal fusion partner, some of them at least. Um, we found that the transactivation domains that are supplied by the C-terminal fusion partners, that they surrogate for the, the truncated YAP1 transactivation domains. We found um, that the YAP1 fusions are resistant to inhibitory HIPPO signaling um, due to A, nuclear localization mediated by um, nuclear localization sequences brought in by the C-terminal fusion partner, and B, due to resistance to proteasomal degradation mediated by the loss of the serine 397 residue of the YAP1 sequence that's important for the degradation. And number five, as said, um, all of these fusions are retained the teeth binding domain. And so YAP1 is a transcription coactivator that does not bind um, DNA itself, but it relies on the interaction with other transcription factors, most importantly, teeth. And teeth, the interaction with teeth is absolutely important for the functions of wild type YAP1. And it's also absolutely important for the functions of the YAP1 fusions. And so to test the oncogenic activity of these YAP1 fusions, we used our RKS TVA system for somatic cell gene transfer. And the RKS plasmid is a replication competent, it generates a replication competent virus. And you can clone your gene of interest into this plasmid. You can then transfect MDF1 chicken cells. They then produce the virus, they infect themselves. And after a couple of passages, basically you have like a high titer and you can inject these cells into nesting and TVA cell uh, mice. And the crux with this virus is that it can only infect um, cells that express the TVA receptor. So by um, generating a transgenic mouse that expresses the TVA receptor on a cell, cell type specific promoter, you can then limit what kind of cells can be infected. And when we, had, when we um, expressed um, these different Japan gene fusions in the brain of nest and TVA CDK and null mice, you could see that all of these were um, oncogenic. And you can also see that there's slight differences in the histomorphology of these different, of the tumors generated by the different fusions. And that already shows you um, that um, some of these functions are different, probably because of the functionality supplied by the C terminal fusion part. And now moving on to the actual part of this talk. Um, YAP1, YAP1 activity and YAP1 fusions in meningiomas. So meningiomas are the most common primary brain tumors in adults. And fortunately, around 90 to 95% of these tumors are benign. So they can be cured by just surgical intervention. However, around three to 5% of these tumors, they're actually malignant and they do recur even after multiple surgeries and chemotherapy and also radiotherapy. So they're basically, you can really treat them. 
And unfortunately, despite the high frequency of these tumors, there's a lack of good genetically engineered mouse models for menin tumors. And that's in part due to the lack of strong oncogenic drivers. And when you look at the genetics of these tumors, you see that around 40% of meningiomas harbor mutations in NF2, which is on top of the hipposignaling pathway and thereby functionally implicating yap one activity. Another 40% of these tumors have mutations in, in TREF7, AKT, KNF4, and those are usually, usually mutually exclusive with NF2 mutations. And around 20% of these have unknown mutations. And when you just look at the the, the subset of NF2 mutant tumors, the benign ones, they literally just have NF2 mutations and chromosome 22 deletions, which harvest NF2. And then when you go to like a higher grade tumors, they then have additional mutations such as cd inter a loss or gains and losses of additional chromosomes. And so um, previously the lab of Felix Saam in Heidelberg, they identified um, YAP1 fusions and most commonly YAP1 member 2 in a subset of pediatric NF2 wild type meningiomas. And since we pre previously worked with um, YAP1 fusions, we then also um, we assumed that the, the hallmarks that we came up with for the different for the other YAP1 fusions, they're probably also true for these fusions. And so the first question that we asked is like, how similar are the pediatric YAP1 mammal to um, positive meningiomas to adult um, other non-fusion positive meningiomas? And for this, we took published RNA sequencing data from 223 human meningioma samples, including six yap one fusion positive meningiomas, um, 10 parasitic astrocytomas non-meningioma samples um, as something else. And we had information of mutational status for NF2, TREF7, KLF4, AKT1, SMO1. And we also had information on the WHO grade of these tumors. And when we, we took the different, um, different sample sets and we did batch correction and we put them on a UMAP, and this was done by Sonali Aurora. And you can see here, basically all the meningiomas cluster together and the PA samples cluster apart from that. So, and you can see that the human Japan fusion positive tumors, they cluster with the meningiomas. And when you then look at the mutational status, you can see that here on the left side in red, you have all the NF2 mutant tumors, whereas on the right side here or here, you have the NF2 wild type tumors. And you can see that the human Japan fusion positive tumors, they cluster with the NF2 mutant tumors, suggesting that the NF2 mutant tumors and the human YAP1 fusion positive tumors, they have a similar gene expression balance. We then looked at the expression of YAP1 target genes, such as CTGF, SIR61, and KRD1. And you can see here that both NF2 mutant tumors and YAP1 fusion positive tumors, they regulate these YAP1 targets very similarly and at a higher level compared to NF2 wild type tumors and also parasitic astrocytomas. We then use the data set of um, pure YAP1 activity to look at these, this, this gene set at a larger, at a broader scale. And for this, we used our previously generated data set of just pure YAP2 point with non fusion YAP1, oncogenic YAP1 expressed in human neural stem cells and um, compared to GFP expressing cells. And this basically leads us to a gene set of around 1,000 upregulated um, genes that are upregulated by YAP1. And when we cluster these human YAP1, uh, these human meningiomas based on these thousand YAP1 regulated genes, we can see again that the human um, YAP1 fusion positive tumors, they cluster very closely with the NF2 mutant tumors, suggesting again that e also for the YAP1 signature, they, have, they are very similar and that they probably work in a very similar way. And the NF2 mutant tumors, they cluster away from those. So the next question that we then asked is, does false expression of yap one 2 in nesting expressing cells in vivo in our mass model as it cause formation of meningioma-like tumors. And again, we used our RKS-TVA system and overexpressed the yap one 2 fusion. And first to see basically if we can express the fusion in the likely origin um, and space of origin for meningiomas, which is the meninges, and um, we stained for nesting in our mouse system in neonatal mice, so we injected P0 mice. And you can see here that nesting is expressed in the meninges, suggesting that we can deliver this, this fusion to, this, to the potential region of origin for meningiomas. And indeed, when we do this, when we express this fusion in CDK and renal nesting TVA mice, we do get tumors that resemble um, human, human meningiomas by gross morphology, but also by histology. And then we can also track the growth of these tumors using MRI. And you can see the growth over several days and um, importantly, these tumors are similar to human tumors, also contrast enhancing, which is a feature of, of human meningiomas. We then isolated RNA from these mouse tumors and we 
plotted it onto our UMAP of human tumors. And you can see here that the mouse tumors, they fall very closely into the NF2 mutant um, subset of human meningiomas um, and closely to the F1 fusion tumors, suggesting that our mouse tumors resemble human NF2 mutant and F1 fusion positive tumors very closely. So going on to, to talk a little bit about the biology of the F1 mammal 2 fusion, um, as I previously said, um, the activity of YAP, wild type YAP1 is regulated by the HIPAA signaling pathway, and it leads to um, nuclear exclusion at high densities. So the HIPAA signaling pathway is on at high densities, and you can see here where it, it's off at low densities, and at low densities, wild type YAP1 is localized in the nucleus. However, at high densities, wild type YAP1 is excluded from the nucleus, so it's basically inhibited by cell, cell contact. However, in turn, um, both the YAP1 mammal 2 fusion and wild type mammal 2, they're both stuck constitutively in the nucleus, so they cannot be excluded anymore by high density, suggesting that the fusion is basically less responsive to the HIPAA signaling pathway and somewhat deregulated. And we can, we can see the same thing in, in mouse tumors um, and that, that are induced by the fusion. We also see like a purely nuclear localization, basically that the fusion is stuck in the nucleus. We then um, used a, um, an assay, an in vitro assay, to measure YAP1 activity exerted by, the, by either wild type YAP1 or the YAP1 mammal 2 fusion with or without additional co expression of the tumor suppressor NF2 that's on top of the HIPAA signaling pathway. And you can see here for wild type YAP1, when you co express NF2, the activity of wild type YAP1 is basically significantly, um, very significantly reduced. In turn, when you do the same thing with the YAP1 mammal 2 fusion, um, it's significantly less um, inhibited, again, suggesting that the YAP1 MAMA2 fusion is not as regulatable by the HIPAA signaling pathway. And um, in addition, um, one thing that is very important, what I mentioned before, is that um, WALTAP um, YAP1 and also the different other YAP1 fusions, they basically need um, the interaction with T transcription factor for their um, oncogenic activity and for their functionality. And this interaction is mediated. Um, by the TEAT um, interaction complex or the TEAT interaction domain at the end terminus of um, wild type YAP1. And uh, most importantly, it's mediated by the serine 94 residue. And when you mutate this, um, this residue to an alanine, you can basically block this interaction and you can block um, the, the functionality of both wild type YAP1 or also the different YAP1 fusions. And when we again use our Luciferase assay to measure the, the wild type activity of either wild type YAP1 or the mutated YAP1 or the fusion or the mutated fusion, you can see that both wild type YAP1 and the fusion, they significantly lose their ability to induce um, this kind of reporter assay when they are unable to bind to teats. And then when we inject this, this, um, this mutant version that cannot bind to teats anymore of YAP1 mammal 2, we inject it in our mouse model, we then see that it's not able to form tumors anymore, suggesting that this interaction with T transcription factor is absolutely necessary for the oncogenic functions of the YAP1 mammal 2 fusion. And so since we, since we looked at, um, we, since, since we could show that um, YAP1 activity is essential and it is present in um, the YAP1 mammal 2 fusion, we then looked, um, is pure YAP1 activity, is it sufficient to also cause tumors? So is it not just part of it, but is it also sufficient to induce the formation of these tumors? And for this, again, we used um, a two-point mutant YAP1, um, since um, the HIPPO signaling pathway and LADS basically phosphorylates YAP1 at different serine residues, and these two serine 127 and serine this is this is for the nuclear exclusion and serine 100, uh, 397, which is for the uh, for the degradation. These are the two main uh, most important ones. And when you mutate these two to alanine to serine to alanine, um, this non-fusion YAP1 is basically deregulated. And you can see here, it basically shifts from wild type versions to wild type one is here as well. It shifts toward the oncogenic fusions and um, um, it's basically deregulated. And um, when we do another assay where we basically look at how closely does the 2SA YAP1, the two point mutant YAP1, how closely does it, does, does it resemble NF2 loss in human neural stem cells? And we, so we, we performed RNA sequencing on either um, wild type F1 expressing cells, GFP expressing cells, control guide RNA cells, untreated cells, or cells that have um, NF2 knockouts. We can see 
that the, 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 the two A cells, two, two A Japan expressing cells, and NF2 cells, they basically have a very similar gene expression profile. And you can see this is here as well. If you look at the differentially expressed genes um, between 2SA and uh, SG, NF2, compared to GFP, you can see that they share a vast majority of their, of their DAGs, both upregulated and downregulated. And they basically express um, the YAP1 targets very, very similar. So showing that 2SA, YAP1, and, S, and NF2 loss do very, very similar things in these cells. And that is very important because the vast majority of the, the human meningiomas, they're basically NF2 loss. So using this model, we can then model the more common type of, of meningiomas. And you can see indeed, when we overexpress just the two-point mutant YAP1, not the fusion, but just pure YAP1 activity, we get very similar meningioma-like tumors. And again, we can track these tumors using MRI, to see how they grow here from two different mice. They're contrast enhancing, so they behave very, very similar. And then when we, the last thing that we did is basically we looked at, can we use this, this, this dependence on yap one teat interaction of the fusion and also two point mutant yap one um, can we use that to, for like some kind of therapeutic intervention? And so with a collaboration with um, Taran Gujar and Alina Arakaki, also from Farhaj, what, what we did is we basically took tumors that were induced um, from, from extracranial meningioma-like tumors from our mouse model. We, they prepared cuboids and then they can culture them ex vivo for several days and treat them with several drugs, including um, Yapontid inhibitors, such as vodoporfin or also Vivaci drugs. And you can see that this is uh, like a dose dependent inhibition of, um, of viability of these cuboids when you treat them with these inhibitors. And that's true for Yapo mammal 2 driven tumors. And the same is true for 2SA Yap1 non fusion driven tumors. And um, just summar summarizing, and this this up so yep on fusion positive meningiomas they resemble NF2 mutant uh, meningiomas in, in the human in both global and yep one related gene expression and um, the expression of yep mammal 2 but also um, point mutant yep one um, in in our mouse system is sufficient to induce um, meningioma like tumors in, in, in mice in CD contain all mice and um, similar to other yep one yep fusions um, yep one mammal 2 exerts oncogenic yep one yep one activity that is insensitive to a signaling pathway, and that's in part due to the constitutive nuclear localization of the fusion. And um, with this, I would like um, to thank everybody from the lab, Eric, um, um, and all of our collaborators and our funding sources. And if you're interested, please check out our two papers that we just that we published um, two years ago and just now, a couple of months ago. And thank you very much for the organizers. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Frank. That was that was great. Um, so now we have some time for questions and answers, um, and we've got a, a few here on the Q and A. Please do, as we're having our discussions, if questions come up in your mind, um, type them in there. A and I'll start with one for, for Katya. That um, the question that I had, and that was also asked in the Q and A, is. Is there any correlation between genotype and sensitivity to either MEK inhibitor or your combination? Um, I don't remember you necessarily also saying something about RAS mutations or not. That's a wonderful question. Uh, we we believe so. Uh, that's definitely something that we we hope to to go deeper on it and to analyze it, but we definitely believe there's some sort of correlation for sure. And any any correlation with cytogenetics or chromosomal translocations? Do you know, Do you have, maybe you don't have all that data on all the samples, I, I don't know. We don't, we don't have that yet, but we, we hopefully like to acquire that like in the near future, <laughs> totally. It's, it's a very important like uh, answer to have to understand what's happening because we're seeing the mechanisms, but not necessarily like what's behind that. So we definitely want to to go deeper on that to understand how that plays a role in the resistance. And is it your belief or hypothesis that the C it sounds like you think the CCL2 CCR2 axis is being activated either in an autocrine or paracrine fashion, at least in your in vitro system? Um, 
and these are produced by monocytes. So you might guess that there would be some correlation between kind of monocytic type leukemias and this expression. Is that the thought process? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we we're even like discussing that uh, this past week when we we're like discussing what to present and everything. And we believe so. Uh, we definitely want to, like, as I mentioned in the end, uh, we want to pinpoint that and see exactly where it's coming from to kind of like correlate the expression location with this response that we see downstream. But possibly related to like the monocytes and maybe my macrophages. We not entirely sure. Sure. Yeah, no, those are those yeah, yeah, yeah. And the new press here, like she can definitely uh, if I can add to Scott, those are great question. Um actually it was interesting and good to have your feedback. The correlation you were asking the patient which were traumatic resistance actually has low monocytes in peripheral blood. So one of the role of MCP or CCL2 is uh, as a chemo attractant when it recruit monocytes to the site of like tumor in at least in solid tumor. So we were wondering if something like that happening uh, in, in this setting and then maybe MCP, like preliminary data suggests that it's coming from a stroma also, not just monocytes. So maybe it has role more in recruitment of monocytes to like stroma uh, sites and maybe some sort of like histopathology of bone marrow biopsies may help understanding uh, what exactly happening with MCP in this environment. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. I mean, it, it, may be a little difficult to tease out uh, those details, but um, it, I think it would be interesting, and you mentioned that you're going to do this, that if you have an in vivo system, PDX models might or might not be good for something like this, kind of hard to know, but if it is an autocrine or paracrine loop, perhaps you would see that in, in mm -hmm. a PDX. If it's stromal-based, that, that, who knows, that, that's a little bit harder. Um, and, and I assume, I can't remember from, I, this is, this database you're working from is Jeff Tyner's database, I, I'm assuming. Yes, yes, exactly. And then prior, your prior question, there was no correlation with ELN, um, like ENL criteria, like cytogenetics and stuff. But um, as you would expect, to matinib show more sensitivity to patient with has NRAS mutation, but Beyond that, resistance was spread across genetic subtype. Then some other people asked that question. Uh, there is no particular genetic subtype where we saw the resistance, but the sensitivity to NRAS mutant sample, which, which would make sense. The sensitivity of NRAS mutant samples, you said, yeah? Yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, we're, we're not finished with questions for you guys, but I also have one here for, for Frank. So. Um, We'll, we'll switch from leukemia to brain tumors for a minute. Um, so one of the first question, and I have a few as well, just on the, the biology of the fusion. Um, it's, the question is, meningiomas are common in patients who received, received radiation as kids. Um, any indication from your studies or otherwise uh, why that might be the case? Um, not, not really. Um, that's not, we, do, we didn't really look at that, um, but I just I actually just looked it up right now because I saw the question. Uh, <laughs> it seems to be that um, NF2 loss is less frequent in radiation-induced meningiomas than in, in sporadic meningiomas. So I, I, my assumption is that the radiation just, just shoots up the genome and basically induces mutations in the, in the cell of origins in the meninges. And they, they seem to have like a different biology generally than, than sporadic meningiomas. So YAP1 activity might be less common than in sporadic ones. And the translocations are, are not more common in the radiation-induced ones. Uh, more I, I do not know. I do not know. And you might wonder if there's a fragile site there so that translocation can occur in the presence of radiation that happens in leukemia. Yeah, uh, it, now. it could be. It could be. So a question about the, the biology, of, or, or two questions, I guess. One is about your model, and, and I don't I should understand the details a little bit better, but 
do you only get the fusion expression in the meninges or do you get it in other places as well? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so in this case, in this sense, our auto model is a little bit dirty because um, nesting is expressed, especially in neonatal cells, neonatal, neonatal mice is expressed in, in several um, cell types in the brain. For example, we also use it to induce gliomas. So it's induced around the ventricles, but you also have um, ventricular meningiomas to some degree in, in humans and also in our model. Um, so it's it's not as precise as like a like a model where you have like a germline expression in like arachnoid cap cells or something like this. So in this sense, because we just inject the the the, the, the virus or like the virus producing cells into neonatal cells, and then every every cell that has nesting can be can take up this kind of virus. So it's a little bit dirty in this kind of sense. But it does the, actually. I think it's interesting. It does mean that the meningeal cells are particularly sensitive to the yeah. fusion because you're pre yeah. presumably getting it expressed in multiple yeah. cell types. Yeah. Even when you take out P16, it's still the meninges that are quite yeah. sensitive. Yeah. So it's, it's very interesting because the different other YAP1 fusions, like YAP1 TV3, we don't see these tumors arising from these from these fusions. So the YAP1 mammal 2 fusion seems to be kind of special in this kind of case. Even though... And, yeah. And, and it looks like you're, and you've shown this, that the fusion essentially is a YAP gain of function. Um, and is that largely because the C-terminal part is where the phosphorylation site is in that pathway and you just lose? The, is that is that the thought process? So that's that's part of it. I would say the loss of the serine 397 residue is definitely completely essential. However, there's, there's two versions of the YAP1 mammal 2 fusion. One that just retains exon 1, of YAP1 and basically loses most of the, the phosphorylation sites, most of the serines, but there's a longer one that retains the first five exons and that, re that retains all of the serine residues except the 397 version. And they behave very similar. We, we, we couldn't express the longer one, but in our in vitro assays, they behave very similar, suggesting that the, the first four serine residues that are responsible for nuclear exclusion they seem to be overruled by the nuclear nuclear localization sequence in the mammal two sequence. And is there any difference between the the fusion protein driven gene expression program and the wild type YAP gene expression program, or is it essentially identical? No, there's there's a there's a difference. And when we saw um, we didn't do this this fine tuned experiment with this kind of fusion, but when we looked at the other fusions that we previously published on. Um, they always had something in addition to pure YAP1 signaling. And here, what we saw as well, first of all, it more strongly activated the expression of these YAP1 targets. But then for sure, the, the, the C-terminal partner also brings something else. And MAML2 is um, involved in, in notch signaling. And um, we, we also showed something. We didn't include it in the, in the, in the paper, but we showed that the, the, the fusion was able to Induce um, the expression of some notch downstream target genes independent independent of notch signaling, and that's something that was specific to that fusion. None of the other fusions could do that, and wild type YAP1 couldn't do that either. So, so you have that. both a gain. So that's maybe some type of neomorphic function that the fusion has that the wild type YAP doesn't. Yeah, the question is how important is that additional function functionality compared to just the overexpression, like the overactivation of YAP1 activity. And one last question for you, and then I'm going to move back to leukemia. And I, maybe I should know this. How do the inhibitors of um, the, how does the YAP TED inhibition work? What do those molecules actually do? Yeah, so there's there's different different versions and different um, different different drug types, and they work in a different type. So the Vivachi drugs, they basically this, they they work in two different ways. First of all, they they just block the interaction. They kind of they just sterically block it, but then they also pulmonate um, teeth and they, they lead to degradation of teeth as well. So there's they bind to teeth and lead to its degradation? Yeah, yeah. They, they, well, they, they pulmonate, 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 sorry. Pulmonate, yeah. Pulmonate, yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Huh, okay. Well, that's interesting. Are those molecules in, in any type of clinical development or are they still... So they've, they've Vivaci, and so there's different, different labs working on these teeth inhibitors it's, it's like a big big thing right now and Vivarchi they fused it they, they had like a clinical trial for mesothelioma because they have very similar genetics compared to meningiomas they also have nf2 loss and they also have KLF 
get F7, Trev4, and so F, and so on and so forth. So they've used it for NF2 mutants, mesotheliomas, and they see some kind of effect. Interesting. Okay, we're going to move back to leukemia. So a question for you, Katya, which um, is, what is the mechanism that upregulates CCL2 expression? You probably saw that. that that's, I'm guessing that's not a simple question, but... Uh, <laughs> I was like, here, I saw the question, I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> that's, that's a tricky one, but that's a very, very important, very interesting, uh, for sure. Uh, I don't think we, we have like a definitive answer for, for that question, like that I can just like, that's exactly how CCO2 is upregulated. I feel that it's one of my missions to try to figure out, figure that out. But if everyone wants to add something to it, but we. I, I mean, I guess a, a kind of follow on to that is: Do you think it's it's really up regulation, or is this just normal, if you will, expression of a particular cell type, a particular leukemia type, or um, or the microenvironment kind of broadly? Oh. Personally, I believe there's definitely some the bone marrow niche in some way uh, it's affecting the production of cco2 there it's also possible that it it's, it, co it correlates with the type of sample that we're dealing with uh the background of, like the genetic background of the patient uh and maybe some sort of like feedback loop that in especially in the resistance that kind of like provides more and more uh, signal for the production of the CO2 to keep this uh, deviation in the pathway, the RAS pathway, to continue with the drug resistance. I feel like there's a combination of factors that definitely affect the highly yeah. It's CCO2. probably, I suspect yeah. it's, you, you have some microenvironmental influence, some cell intrinsic influence, um, and different leukemias therefore behave profiles yeah so, yeah um and and it will be interesting when you try to model this in vivo just to see how similar and that'll be model dependent but to see how similar the results are to the in vitro um, results Good. one other question about uh, just probably, uh, the last, probably the last one scott okay yep um Ruxolitinib seemed to be behaving the same, very similarly in at least in the early assays. What, what do you think? What's going on there? <laughs> <laughs> what's going on there? Uh, that's a great question. <laughs> I mean, do you think it's a similar concept that Rux inhibits um, some type of Jack signaling and in in sensitive cells, and you get just other pathway activation? in by ccl2 oh definitely uh i even include that as a branch in my final pathway because we see some modifications uh down the line in step five uh so we definitely think that might be one of the routes that the cells might take in order to overcome like like to kind of like escape from the trimetinib treatment and survive and, and so your your combination <laughs> Might also be relevant for rocks too, if we uh, ever get to the point to where we're treating patients with with yeah, AML. for sure, yeah. So I think it's probably time to wrap up an excellent session. Thank you, Dr. Armstrong, for the moderation. Thank you, Dr. Gazella, De Olivia, Rabola, for a great presentation. Thank you, Dr. Szyszewski, as well. Um, our next presentation is January twenty six. The title is the Department of Energy NCI Collaboration Mosaic for Advancing Computational Models for Cancer Research by Dr. Hansen. We look forward to joining that presentation as well. And thanks again for everyone who participated today. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.